Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the class on two Peters. We are now moving in to the book of Second Peter. Very exciting. Um, we've gone through all of the different chapters in First Peter. Uh, he is talking to the church in Asia Minor, giving them uh, excellent um, guidance on how they're called to live as believers in Jesus and how they are uh, to know him deeply. And we move into to Second Peter. I'm going to start off by reading the introduction to this book. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who, through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, have received a faith as precious as ours. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. So Peter really starts this book the way that a lot of the books are, or the letters to the churches are started in the New Testament. He gives uh, the identification of who he is, um, where he says, Simon Peter. And then he um, addresses the recipients of the letter. And then there's that obligatory kind of introductory greeting. Now, often when we look at scripture, we kind of glaze over these introductions as if there's not a lot of meat there. We kind of think of them as just formality. But we can't, we have to be careful not to do that because we shouldn't be wasting any of the words that are written for us in this book. Um, right off the start, there is deep meaning and purpose to the words that Peter is communicating here. Two things that I want to bring out just from this introduction that I believe uh, need a deeper look and a deeper understanding from us uh, before we go forward are one, Peter is using a very common form of communication for the time. Think of it like in uh, our modern day as like an email. Uh, at the end, often we say, you know, blessings or regards. So he's using that kind of a salutation. Um, Think of it uh, also like hey, the medium he's using is like kind of like our social media post for the day or maybe like a podcast. Um, Peter, however, he when he does this, he uses something that's really kind of uncommon for a salutation. Where it'd be normal to start a letter of this type with the words cherain, which means greetings, Peter instead uses the word cheris, and that means grace. So right off the bat, Peter is communicating something very profound to his intended recipients. He is reminding of them of a grace that binds them all together, binds us all together through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To skip over this is to ignore the context for the entire letter. We're connected. We are one in body. We are His through grace and this is not of ourselves, but it is a gift from God. Secondly, we should never forget the context of the relationship between the Jew and the Gentile. The Jews were God's special people. And this was a status that many of the leaders and teachers of the day would have been keen to protect. There was a desire, of course, to see the Messiah come, but it came with a hope that when he did come, all of the Jewish leaders or teachers would be exalted to positions of strength and power over that of the Gentile. But this was never a part of God's plan. The inclusion of the Gentiles into God's plan was one of the biggest theological debates in the early church. Peter hits on a very important matter when he reminds us that the church is for Jews and for Gentiles. They have, and I'm a Gentile, I'm not Jewish, they have, I have, you have, many of us have received a faith that is as precious as being God's special chosen people. We are now actually a part of that family. So the introduction has a lot of depth to it, has a lot of meaning to it, and now we can go on from there, and we will read verses 3 through 11. His divine power has given us everything that we need for a godly life. Through our knowledge of Him, who has called us by His own glory and goodness, through these He has given us His very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness 
and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So a typical New Testament letter would move from the introduction into some type of form of thanksgiving. But in this situation, Peter goes straight to it. The section plays out, honestly, almost like a three-point sermon. Verses 3 and 4, Peter tells us that we have everything that we need for a godly life. Godliness is an extremely important part of the overall theme of this mini-sermon, and Peter wants us to know that we can live a godly life. The power to live this way, however, is not wrapped up in our own ability to be pious. It's not wrapped up in our ability to practice the spiritual disciplines. Peter tells us that this power comes from our knowledge of Him who called us. Meaning... You need to know God, not on some superficial, superficial head knowledge level. True knowledge of God comes from time with him. He has made a promise to you. Do you believe it? Well, let me ask you this. Do you tend to believe promises given to you by people that you don't know? We cannot escape the truth that in order to truly live godly lives and live in the promises of what he has given to us, of who we can be through him, we have to know him. In order to please him, we have to know him. The second points in verses 5 through 9 remind us that we do, in fact, have a work to do. We can't get lazy. We can't just sit back and expect that God is just going to do all this work and there's nothing that we have to put into it. Living by grace can often leave us in this murky kind of area where sometimes we don't completely understand our role in living a godly life. Peter dispenses with any thought that we might have that we don't have to play a role. We have work to do, though if we rely solely on our own work, we'll come up short each and every single time. So we may, we may read these list of virtues that he has, that we're called uh, to make every effort to live out. We are. We're called to live out all of these virtues. We might read them as though um, it starts with goodness. It looks that way, but there's an important word that comes before goodness. It's faith. Peter tells us to add to our faith all of these virtues. And that takes us straight back to our relationship that we have with God. We have to be in relationship with Him first. Then out of that relationship, we do the work that is needed in order to live a godly life. I cannot live a life of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. I can't live that life unless I know God, unless the Holy Spirit is in me and, 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 and He's leading and He is guiding me. I'm sorry to tell you this, but you can't do it on your own. Godliness that pleases the Lord is godliness that includes Him. It's, it's Him. It's you living in relationship with him, it is you living out what he tells you to live out, not your own ideals for the way that you feel that virtues are. Because we just kind of mess that up a lot. Um, my idea of justice is not God's idea of justice. My idea of patience is not God's idea of patience. My idea of love is not God's idea of love. So again, know him. Because to know him is to love him. The third part in these verses in this mini-sermon is uh, meant to confirm our position, to confirm these people's position with God. Peter makes a strong call to action at this point. 
And you might think, isn't that what Peter did when he said make every effort? Well, yes, of course he was making a call to action. He was telling people what they needed to do. But like any really good speaker, Peter points back to the call to action on a deeper level that should hit each of us right in our heart muscles. First, remember that you have been called and that you are chosen by God. Don't forget that. Two, remember your actual position in this relationship to your new life. You are not the one in control. You are not the one with the strength and the power. This was already given when Christ died for our sins. This has been taken care of. The power is his. Now you need to do everything Peter is saying so that the old you doesn't take back over again. Third, remember that there is a promise given to you. It is an eternal promise, and it is given by Jesus himself. 2 Peter uh, 1, 12 through 15 says, So I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them. I'll always remind you of them even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have. I think it is right to refresh your memory as long as I live in this tent of this body because I know that I will soon be put aside. As our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me, and I will make every effort to see that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things. In this paragraph, Peter speaks very much about his own circumstances. This can be difficult to find the purposes uh, in the verses that relate directly to our own lives for guidance on our walk with the Lord because very much it talks about him. But there is teaching here for you and for me. That is specifically the role of memory. There is a role for memory in our spiritual walk with the Lord. God calls his people over and over again in the Old Testament to remember the work that he has done. Exodus 13, 3, commemorate this day, the day you came out of Egypt. He is saying, remember it. Do not forget what God has done for you. Deuteronomy 7, 18 says, remember well what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh. Remember his strength. Remember how he is greater than any leader that is on this earth. And then Jesus himself teaches us at the Last Supper, do this in remembrance of me. His call on us is do not forget my work. Do not forget my sacrifice. Do not forget my power to overcome sin and death. And what I want you to think about in your own life, what have you asked God for? I mean, I know you've asked God for things. Do you remember the prayer requests that you made to God years ago? Do you remember how they were answered or did they just fade off in the distance? Are you like most of us who are easily blown around by the circumstances of life? And do you forget when God answers prayer, if it's an answer of yes or if an answer of no is not the issue? The fact of the matter is that God is involved in our prayers. When we pray, he hears us. When we ask, he hears us. Do you remember how God treats you on this earth and how he has in the past. Peter is urging, remember. What will that look like for us? Remembering. Because I want you to remember. I want you to remember every time God has blessed you. I want you to remember every struggle that you have had that God has walked through with you. How will you be able to return to that? There's a simple, simple answer to that. Write it down. Make your prayer requests known to Jesus, but write them down. When he answers what you, have, what, what, what you have asked for, write it down and don't just leave it in a book on some shelf. Return to it. Go back to it and look at how good your God is. You will be amazed at the amount of times he brings miracles into your life. And they might look like little miracles on the surface, but these add up and they become just your relationship with God. Over and over again in the supernatural, in the spiritual realm, he is interacting and and he is working with you and for you. But the biggest thing is we can't forget. We cannot forget. Even in the deepest and most powerful truths, those often need to be brought back to our hearts and to our minds. 
we must always, always be reminded. So when you hear Pastor Peter speaking on something that you have heard of before, don't say, oh yeah, 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 I know that. That is a truth from Scripture that you need to be reminded of. And if I know my pastor, and I think I do, he's not going to get tired of reminding you how beautiful, how wonderful, amazing, powerful, strong our God is. He's going to tell you again and again because you need to be reminded. I need to be reminded. 2 Peter 1, 16 to 21 closes off this chapter uh, and it says for we did not follow cleverly divided stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty he received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying this is my son whom I love with him I am well pleased we ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. We also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable. And you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will. But prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. A Peter, he moves into reminding us of something else. He reminds us of the strength of the claim of Christ. That he is the Son of God, that he has the power to forgive sins, and that he will, in fact, return again one day. See, it's one thing to hear stories of people making claims similar to Jesus. They would have been all over the place. Other messiahs came and, and went and they were destroyed and, and they really had no authentic claim to the throne. Jesus is the only one who does. And the key factor there is witnesses. When Peter writes this, he's not writing this as some fool who heard a story. Peter was on the Mount of Transfiguration. He heard what the Father said about who Jesus was. It's a very important note, the shift from I, which Peter used at the start of this letter, to the we at the close of the chapter. The strength of that we. See, it wasn't even just Peter there. It was Peter, it was James, and it was John. And especially now that we know in fullness what these guys went through when they witnessed the transfiguration and afterwards. Peter, he was martyred on the cross. James, son of Zebedee, he was beheaded in Jerusalem. John, banished to the island of Patmos. I mean, he, he wrote the book of Revelation. Now, each one of these guys with their... With their situations in their lives, the strength of the testimony of them is that they witnessed these things. They knew whether this claim was real or it was not. If they were lying, they would have known that they were lying. I do not know of three guys, let alone the other uh, disciples, but three guys that are going to give up their life, each one of them, for a lie. It is just not going to happen. They would have simply been able to, to, to recant any claim that they had about who Jesus was, and, and at least one of them would, would have had a different fate, if not all three of them would have been uh, saved from either death or, or from banishment. The message they share is not a story. The message they share is real life. Peter doesn't just leave it there, however, he continues on and he makes a plea to another authority, that of the Old Testament prophets. And this is a powerful claim. In this particular group of verses, Peter is making a very strong statement about the inspiration of Scripture. If we are honest with God's Word, we have to acknowledge that Scripture is inspired by God. 
We call it words like we, we, we in, uh, in, in scripture, we, we call it things like God breathed. Right? It's, it's inspired by God, but he chose to use people to write the words. This means that there are different writing styles. We see it in that. We see it in the different idiosyncrasies of the writer on their different focuses that they are called to write about. And there's a theory out there that would suggest that humans might be just some kind of God-infused dictational robot used kind of like a monkey uh, just to, to slap letters together and form God's word. But scripture has different focuses. It has different styles. It has different writers. Like, I, I believe God used humanity in all of its humanity. And I think if we're honest with scripture, we can see that. There's also a ton of scripture that was applicable to a time before us. And there's a lot of scripture that is open to interpretation. And if you think that there's scripture that isn't open to interpretation, I'd ask you, why do we have so many denominations today? If there's no interpretation involved, why do we have pe different people feeling different things about the initial evidence of the Holy Spirit? It's because how we read scripture, how we relate to God, how we walk with him and how he reveals his word to us. In this, it becomes essential that we have a balanced view of God's word. We must acknowledge the role man has played in the words and we must understand that for, for teaching us about faith, about who God is and how we are called and told we are supposed to live, there is no greater, no more powerful word than the Bible. This is why we can trust the words of the prophets. In a book about God, we can trust that God knew what his plan was and who the Messiah would be. The prophets very clearly, very clearly point us straight to Jesus. There really could be no other. If we read Daniel 9, 24 through 27, we see that the chosen one, would be cut off or killed before the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. It also talks about an anointed one who comes after that. So what then are we supposed to believe? Are we supposed to believe that there's two messiahs, one who comes first and dies, and then another different one who comes later? In Judaism, they don't even believe that. But we do know the temple has been destroyed. There could be nobody between Jesus and the destruction of that temple who came in who could make the same claim. But what we do know is Jesus said, I'm coming again. So it is the anointed one who was destroyed. And it is the anointed one who lives forever and reigns in power. Praise God. It is Jesus. Jesus fulfills prophecy. Over and over again, he fulfills prophecy. And I've read, there's people who talk about this frequently. Some people say he's, he has fulfilled 40 plus prophecies. Some people say 60 plus prophecies, 100 plus. I've read, uh, I've read writings that say the 300 prophecies that Jesus fulfilled. But I don't even want to get hung up on those numbers. Because let's just take it down to eight prophecies of Jesus. What if Jesus fulfilled just eight of the prophecies of the Old Testament? What would it actually take? for that to happen. So there's a professor named Peter Stoner. He's, uh, he applied mathematical science of probability onto exactly that question. What would it take for, for a man by chance to, in their lives, fulfill eight prophecies that were written in the Bible? And here's the number that he came up with. One in 10 to the power of 17. We're talking one with 10 and 17 zeros behind it. I don't even know what that number is. I mean, like, a million has what? Six zeros behind it? So 17 zeros behind that. Let's put this into a different context. That is like taking a silver dollar and covering it over Ontario, the whole province of Ontario with silver dollars, up to a foot and a half. Then... Put a mark on one of them, go find a brother who is blind and say, pick out that one silver dollar that I have marked. It is like him being able to do that. Jesus fulfills prophecy. 
So Peter's appeal to the prophets as strength of Christ's claim is not just a good one. It's truth. There are multiple, multiple, multiple prophecies. Not just eight. There are multiple prophecies that Jesus has fulfilled. It is truth. He fulfilled prophecy. He is Lord. People who knew the truth died for that truth. Scripture paints that extremely vivid picture of who the Messiah is. It is Jesus. So I hope you guys remember. I hope you remember the God that you love, the God that you served, your first love. I hope this has encouraged you today. I hope you're strengthened to remember who he is, to think about him, to ask him for big things, and then to, to write down those things you ask for, to, to notice and be thankful and grateful when he answers, when he answers yes and when he answers no. He's got you at heart, the same God who filled all these prophecies, the same God who was beaten, the same God who, who was despised, who was mocked and mocked as king of the Jews, uh, who loves you so desperately. He, he is the truth. Peter's claims are not just strong. They're 100%. So, guys, take that word with you this week. I hope you guys have a really fantastic week. You know I love you. I can't wait to see you all again. Be blessed.